Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Transgender Show. I'm your host, Emily. I'm excited tonight to welcome my guest, Wendy Cole. As a transition mentor, Wendy uses her life experiences to help clients face the significant life changes that come with gender transition. At age 67, Wendy changed her life with her transition. Since 2017, she has guided others through this process. She believes in the mind's powers. She practices mindfulness, shifting her beliefs and energy to support herself going forward, making profound changes in her life, health, and finding joy in being. Everyone, welcome to the show, Wendy Cole. Hi, Emily. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome in. It's great having you here. So, um, yeah, you are a, a, a coach for folks who are right. in transition. How did exactly. you get into that work? And, um, you know, how much of your life does that, does that entail? Is that how you, you make your daily living? That's how I make my daily living. I had um, uh, uh, gender confirm confirmation surgery at NYU Medical Center in uh, August of 2017. And after that, I got involved with helping other girls go through preparing for their surgeries um, on a volunteer basis. And uh, I really enjoyed helping people do that. Um, I also um, probably for about a year, year and a half, volunteered to talk with girls the night before their surgery because they're nervous. Um, and need someone who's been through it to actually talk with them. And so I did that. And I found that I absolutely loved helping people. Um, as far as, uh, at the time I was working as a cashier in a supermarket and that was less than fulfilling, but it was interesting. <laughs> and I actually, uh, decided I'm going to leave that job, uh, set myself up so that I could focus just totally on coaching and uh, figure out how to make a business out of that and how to actually do it and how to help people. Hmm. And because I was so visible in the town that I lived in, I actually had people uh, asking me for help. And that was kind of a thing that just sort of spurred it on. Officially, I went live with my website and Instagram in late December of 2020. That's when it took off and I started as a regular business. Wow. So what were some of the keys to that going from this thing where it's a passion, you love helping people and you're getting people organically coming to you to the point mm -hmm. where you were able to actually make a living from it because you know you're you're trying to help people people are struggling financially all of these things how right wh how did you make that turn and make it into a viable business one i hired a business coach <laughs> and she worked with me through uh the better part of 2020 and then i started setting up the technology i learned about zoom i uh, just started a lot of social media posting and putting myself out there for people to see and being visible and being available to people who actually want to talk to me. Before uh, you can really get into coaching someone, they need to learn about you. They need to trust you first. And that's a big part of developing a relationship with someone is building that trust this is more of a hindsight question looking back were you ready to do it when you started or did you still have a lot to learn yourself um i had a lot a lot to learn i was also going through my own um uh post-op transition you know you one of the things i found at, at the end of my uh surgery and during the first three or four months of recovery it's kind of like you would reach this point of you go Okay, now I've done everything I've wanted to do. What's next? <laughs> and that's when my therapist got on me and she said, don't worry about it. Just be grateful for where you are. All of the things that you've accomplished, reflect on that 
and the universe will open up to you and something else will happen. And that's another piece that kind of dragged me into helping other girls get through this. Hmm. One of the things that I found in my own experience with this, I started in January of 2015. Um, it was only recently in 2014 that I had discovered that this thing that I was born with being transgender was no longer considered a psychological problem with no treatment and no cure. It was considered a now a medical condition that was treatable by therapy, treatable with hormones, and treatable with surgeries. That's a huge change. I found that out at late 2014, and that's when I told my ex-wife, now ex-wife, um, I've got to deal with this. We got married in 1974. In 1978, I was done. Everything I had been told my entire life was, you have a career, you have a wife, you have a house, you have a family, you'll forget all about being a girl. I heard that at age 10 from the first psychiatrist they took me to in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And I was told at that point, this is nothing but a little bit of transvestism, all kinds of all boys experiment. And I just said, no, I'm a girl. I had known that from age three and four. I enjoyed playing with the girls that I met uh, that of my mother's friends. And I didn't enjoy playing with the boys. And it came to a head in, in by age 10 or so. At that point, I was told, um, I think it was after the fourth or fifth uh, uh, psychiatrist visit, I was told, uh, you change your thinking, change your ways. We never want to hear this again. Otherwise, you will be committed and fixed. Oh, this wow. was at a psychiatric center. Mm -hmm. Talk about a change in mindset in the medical community from, from there to now. Right. Well, in 1970, I was 21, 22. I was graduating from college. And... I'd had it. I, I needed to live as a girl. And I found a psychiatrist at that time who was willing to work with me and help me. And he took me to a uh, conference as a case study. And I'm sitting in this room in a hospital conference room with uh, probably about 20 other uh, psychiatrists, all MDs. Okay. And uh, I'm talking, I get about five minutes into what I was saying, and this guy stands up. He goes, okay, everyone, uh, I'll see you next quarter. Turns and looks at me and goes, you're a freak. You should move to New York City and turn tricks like the rest of them. That was in 1970 in New York State. Wow. And also at that time in New York State, if I appeared in public and was read or found out in any way, shape, or form, I would be arrested, fined, and put in jail for appearing in public as a woman. But I was still trying. Well, after that experience and after that, everything just fell apart, and I went back into full repression mode. And I figured, okay, what the hell? I know it's all bullshit, but I'll try the wife and family and the whole bitch. <laughs> I know it's bullshit, but, you know, I can't get any acceptance whatsoever. It's, you know, it's viewed as so wrong that yeah. I guess I have to suck it up and do it, huh? So in late 2014, when I discovered that in 2012, 2012, it changed to what it is today. Something that is treatable with therapy treatable with hormones and treatable with surgeries. 
I had to wait 67 years for it. <laughs> and I knew that doctor was right. If I had tried to transition back in the 70s or 80s or 90s, I couldn't have been part of mainstream society. Mm. It was not accepted. It was not possible. And there was absolutely no medical or therapeutic help for it whatsoever. Well, and the key thing that you bring up is, you know, we, we think about this a lot of times. It's, it's not accepted. It's sort of this general term like, you know, the society, society wouldn't have accepted you. Maybe people get to the leap that, you know, it, it'd be hard to find a partner. You'd be living alone, that sort of a thing. But the the entire system from top to bottom of, you know, every part of society was against you from legal, the, the professionals, the, the medical professionals that are supposed to know better, especially the, right. the, the psych, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, one mm -hmm. of them calling you a freak. That is, it's just bizarre. That's well, so far against and, what they're supposed to be about. Any other people. Mm -hmm. But you just have that complete top to bottom systemic anti-trans view in every aspect of the society. Yeah. You know, it's, if people have this mindset now that that this trans quote unquote phenomena is is coming out of nowhere and this is a new thing it's like no we've always been here but uh you've always hated us so much and had everything stacked against us that we couldn't even begin to consider being ourselves right i started in january of uh 2015 with therapy a uh, wonderful therapist. She was into mindfulness. Um, turns out uh, she was actually a Grateful Dead fan, mm. which was one of my favorite bands. And uh, I worked with her through uh, the whole process of actually changing my whole mindset. Uh, one of the things, it was scary. I was just scared. And I understand that and I get the scared part. But trying to go and live full time as myself, live full time authentically while I'm scared, I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was deal with my fears and my anxieties up front. And that's when I how I learned how to shift my beliefs, how I see myself. Um, develop self-acceptance, develop self-awareness, and actually began to develop self-love. I went through that entire process. Um, the first therapy session that I had, at the end, she was sitting there and she looked at me and she goes, what's your name? And I go, Wendy. And I just watched as she crossed my mail facsimile's name off my folder and wrote Wendy. Uh, she and I are now very good friends. And he, I'm staying in an extended stay hotel in July. And I called her up and I said, I never want you to forget that. You were the very first person ever in my life to accept me for who I am, what I am, unquestioning. Mm -hmm. That was huge. And she was the first of many. I've had a lot of acceptance from people. And um, my second session, um, I brought a pair of heels because I thought it would be more interesting to have my therapy sessions while I was wearing something authentic to me. Yeah, you've established this as a safe space that, you know, your identity is is out and exposed and that it's okay. And so, yeah, um, of course, that's where you're going to be like, okay, I finally found a safe space. I'm going to dip my toe in just a little bit further, exactly. a little bit further. So, but she said to me when I sat down on the couch in her office and was putting on the heels, she looked at me and she said, why didn't you wear them in from the parking lot? I said, what? As this? As a guy? No, <laughs> I can't do that. And But I thought about that all the way through that therapy session. At the end, I looked at her and I said, you know what? I'm going to come next week as Wendy. 
and you're going to that, that that's going to cause two issues one i've got to get myself ready to do that and to show up as wendy and two i'm going to have one hell of a confrontation with my wife because one of the cardinal sins that i could commit was leaving the house in a dress so i could i could do whatever i wanted to in the house as long as i didn't leave mm -hmm. and that was the whole thing why in 1978 she told me oh you can cross dress well i tried it for a while and i hated it and the reason i hated it is i had to take everything off mm -hmm. And I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. And I just didn't want to bother with it anymore because it just reminded me of something that I am and can't be. Isn't that such a, an interesting early part of that, especially for those of us that, that, that fight it or have, you know, societal reasons to fight it is you you'll do that you'll do the cross-dressing thing and it'll be great because you get all done up and you feel that great euphoria and then mm -hmm. as soon as the reality sinks in that you can't go out you can't really be this among people among your friends all of that right. then it sort of swings the pendulum back and you're in a worse spot than you were before you got to experience exactly. that euphoria because it, it it seems even further out of reach now Right. So the next weekend, the next week on Thursday, I went to therapy as Wendy. Hmm. And I hadn't cross-dressed in like 30 years. Oh, wow. Um, one of the things I did was I, I found a, um, a woman who was a cosmetologist and she was also doing my electrolysis. And uh, she encouraged me to come to the uh, salon, even in guy mode, and she'd teach me uh, makeup. So the first time I did go in guy mode, and it was kind of unnerving. <laughs> I found but, that too, uh, that, you know, like you mentioned how your therapist said, you know, wear the shoes and you're like, but I'm in guy mode. And, and it's almost like that especially early on that thought of being half in guy mode, half in girl mode or right. doing girl things in guy mode uh, right. is worse than just doing it fully as yourself. Exactly. I would totally agree with that. So the next time I went to the salon, I went as Wendy. I had a blast. <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> and, um, my therapist and then later the psychiatrist that I switched to, who was very LGBT friendly, um, uh, who took me off all of the meds that I was on and everything, neither one of them could believe the personality change in me going from male to female. I became very social, very outgoing uh very engaged with people and whereas my male representative or male facsimile was just totally withdrawn mm -hmm. didn't like to socialize with anyone didn't participate even in family gatherings that much i would put in an appearance and leave mm -hmm. i just was very uncomfortable with who i was what i was and i had this huge huge secret to hide and it was so much relief just to get rid of it i love that and, that's wonderful yeah um i gave myself little life tests every thursday when i went out because that was my opportunity out of the house in a dress heels looking like a businesswoman going to work I dressed to blend in. That was my that was my whole goal was just to be a woman blending into everyday life in society. And I actually did that. I managed to achieve that. It was something that I didn't know if I could do or not. Um, this was just a huge leap of faith to go forward with this. But 
over the time of going through therapy, giving myself life tests, uh, I'll talk about one of them. Uh, I wanted to stop at Dunkin' Donuts and get a coffee for therapy. Well, I pulled into the parking lot. I had done my visioning of what it would be like to walk into the shop, stand in line with other people. I wasn't doing drive through They didn't have one at this place. And drive through would be cheating. <laughs> So I'm going and standing in line. Well, my meditations, my visioning, all of my uh, trying to shift my thoughts on this and, you know, so I could just go and do it. Just do it. Well, uh, I got there the first, uh, uh, first time. I couldn't open the door. I was so scared I couldn't get out of the car. So... I walked into therapy, I looked at Stephanie, my therapist, and I said, I failed. And she looked at me and said, no, you didn't, Wendy. You'll do it when you're ready. Again, I thought about that all through our therapy session. And I said, yep, I'm going to be ready next week. And the following week, I did do it. The only thing that happened as I was standing there in line is two local police came in behind me. <laughs> and I started to freak. <laughs> that triggered the whole New York State thing back in the 70s. Yeah. And then I go, cut it out. Nothing's going to happen. They don't even, I, I'm looking around. No one's even paying attention to me. I'm just another woman standing there in line. Mm -hmm. And this was fine. No, no. And uh, the funny thing is, is, you know, here I am. I'm a novice with a purse, a wallet, you know, <laughs> and trying to handle that and get the coffee from the <laughs> It was hysterical. <laughs> but I did it. I got better at it, of course. And, you know, I just moved on. I looked, I went over, I started putting the cream in and the sugar and that stuff. And looking the, around. The, those things where you, you subtly try and force yourself to extend the time a little bit each time like make it a little uh -huh. bit longer i'm gonna uh -huh. i'm gonna put in sugar there you know there there isn't there aren't sugar packets i'm gonna i'm gonna go up to the, the counter and ask and, for them those sort of just, things yeah and just look around the room to see if anybody's noticing me mm -hmm. and nobody was that's so wonderful out of there just there. feeling wonderful mm -hmm. so and you oh go ahead and I think that was the last time I really got really scared about doing anything. Mm -hmm. From that point forward, it was just, oh, hell, just do it. Just do it. So um, I wanted to go, to circle back a little bit. You sure. um, talked about in, in that first therapy session, she asked, what's your name? And you blurted it out. You had it right there. Was, was right. Wendy a name that you had um, that you had chosen a long time before? And how did you come up with that one? Oh, I chose that in grammar school. There was a girl in my grammar school class by the name of Wendy. She was pretty, she was popular, and everybody liked her. And I liked her too, but not in that way. I wanted to be her. <laughs> and that's when I decided, I think that was probably either fifth or sixth grade. Hmm. I decided right then and there, if I ever get the opportunity to do this, because at that point in time, I, th I think it was uh, um, Christine Jorgensen was um, in the news and uh, my parents were talking about her and how, how horrible this was and all of that. And uh, I'm going, oh God, if only I could do that. How can I get my surgery in Denmark? <laughs> But um, no, it was definitely influenced by a classmate in uh, fifth or sixth grade. Hmm. And I picked that name. And if I ever get to do this, that's going to be my name. And that's what I did. So you, you found a great therapist. You've got wonderful support. And you already had the writing on the wall from your wife, uh, um, what were some of the early ways you had conversations in coming out to the people around you and the people in your life? Um, 
Well, m my wife at the time had already known about this uh, for the last 36 years of our married life. <laughs> she made the statement to me at w one point of, my first husband left me for another woman. My second husband left me to become a woman. <laughs> okay. Um, you got to find some humor in this. Yeah. Well, you said uh, in the pre-interview that you approached her and told her that you had already started hormones and she basically said that's it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I announced in February of that year that I was starting uh, hormone therapy. Um, and she said, okay, we're done. I'm, uh, we're getting a divorce. And that was something that I expected to hear in 1978 when I told her. I never inquired why. It was pointless to pursue it at that point in 78 because there was nothing I could do. Um, then um, in 2015, I said, okay, and why are we getting a divorce now? And she said, it's very simple. Uh, you're going to develop breasts. You're going to do whatever else you are going to do. Lord knows. And um, uh, I'm not a lesbian and we're getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. And all I said to that was, okay. And that was it. Yeah. Um, the first person I told was um, uh, a guy uh, who was m my ex-wife's friend's son who was gay. So um, he and his family came on Christmas that, that December. So I told him, I'm going to call you. I have something that I want to tell you. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, okay. So I called him up and I said, you're, f you're familiar with LGBT? He goes, yeah, well, you're a G. I'm a T. <laughs> and he goes, what? <laughs> it kind of blew his mind. Never expected it, never had any clue to it whatsoever. Um, he and his partner uh, came to lunch one day and his one statement to me was, you know, it would be a lot easier if you were gay. You could leave the house and nobody would know the difference. <laughs> Whereas with this, you've got to learn a whole new life, presentation, everything. I said, I know, but that's what I need to do. Yeah. Period. Um, well, and, and the, the thing is, we have so many people in our lives, right, that are that are shocked or surprised by us coming out. And it's like, yeah, I spent my whole life masking and trying to pretend and I got pretty darn oh, good at it. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> um, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is it made me totally miserable. Um, in the eighties, I smoked my way through the eighties with pot. Um, in the nineties and the early two thousands, it was all seeing psychiatrists for anxiety, depression, and you name it. And then they write the pills and that was the end of that. So as soon as I started this and saw a new psychiatrist, the first thing he did was took me off all the meds that I was on and um, said, you're on estrogen and you're being yourself, you're being authentic, it's going to work. And he was right. Um, he left me on one prescription, which I phased off of after about four years. And he said, that was just in case you needed it with everything you're going to go through. And I said, I don't think I'm going to need it. I want to get off of it. And he goes, no, you're going to stay on it for a while. And I said, okay. So, but really, it was like the skies opened up. Life became wonderful. 
Well, and it's so amazing to have that doctor that's got that foresight, you know, to to diagnose, okay, so now that we know this about you, we can trace back and, and attribute a lot of these other things to that. And mm -hmm. you're not going to need these things anymore because right. if if you really are trans and this is really what's going on, then this is going to this is going to help a lot of those things. Right. As as soon as I started living full time as a woman, it made all the difference in the world. I don't, the moving company brought all my stuff into my first apartment and it was in New Hope, Pennsylvania, wonderful community. Um, I was on a, uh, a small street in a condominium apartment complex. It was all kind of mixed. Uh, there were three gay couples, a uh, couple of heterosexual couples and some single people like myself. Hmm all on that street. And it turned out to be a very social street too. I had a blast. <laughs> we had uh, a progressive Christmas party dinner and I served the soup out of my apartment. Mm. And what really kind of though blew my mind was um, I got a flowers left at my front door my second week living there Welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, their names, Chad and Jason, number 15. Well, it turns out I found out from them that there was a running bet in the neighborhood whether or not I was trans or cis. <laughs> and then um, I walked down to their apartment um, uh, Sunday evening at about nine o'clock. And I introduced myself and I said, okay, um, you have any questions? I'm an open book. Um, ask anything you want. And uh, they did, especially uh, Chad. Uh, we talked until like 3.30 in the morning. And the thing that really blew me away was uh, all the gay people that I was meeting just didn't really fully comprehend the tease. Didn't get it. Um, they go, okay, well, there are people that come into town uh, um, and hang out at the gay bar for the weekend and cross-dress all the time. They do that once every three or four, once every three months or so. Okay. Uh, but you, you're deaf. You, what are you doing? I said, I'm a woman. Mm. And uh, the only thing I haven't done is I haven't had surgery yet, but I'm definitely going to do that. That has to happen. When you, and, when you're at that period, um, oh, let me, let me go ahead. Let me let you finish. If there was something yeah. more that you wanted to add on that story. Well, um, th that whole evening is when I discovered that the gay guys just didn't didn't really understand the whole process of of how we are. Um, to make a long story short, I used to go to the gay bar uh, for happy hour because that's when the music was down. It was still good, but it was down, and I could talk to all the people at the bar, and I enjoyed the hell out of doing that. It was very social. That was my social life was talking to people at the bar, and. I would get questions like, well, you're going to have surgery. How can you do that? Well, I'm correcting my birth defect. <laughs> I'm aligning my body to match who I am inside, who my, what my inner being is. I'm aligning my body to that. Don't know how, but that's, I'm going to happen. That's going to, that's going to happen. The other thing that I would say to them is I would start with them. You were married. Yeah. You had a wife. Yeah. You had a family. Yeah. You got, you came out, you got divorced. You moved out of your house and now you're living your life as a gay man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only difference between you and me, you became a G, I became a T. Mm -hmm. We all went through the same stuff in the beginning. And I made a very positive impression 
on that entire community by doing that, by putting myself out there, sharing my life with them, and talking about how much we have in common as opposed to what our differences are. I love that. I love that you're able to do that and, and be that spokesperson and, and go out there and change minds. It's funny that it right. was that you needed to do so much of that within the gay community. But, you mm -hmm. know, that's great that you're able to do that. When it came to your your previous community, you know, before you've moved out, before you've found this new neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. did was there anybody in your, your previous circle, friends, family, co-workers, things like that, that you came out to and you were surprised by their level of support for you? Yes. Um, at the time, I was running a, I was doing an in-home computer repair and technology business. Um, using my uh, uh, technology skills and knowledge acquired over the decades uh, to go into people's homes and help them with their tech. And I had about 120 uh, customer mailing list. So I composed an email and I sat on it for a little bit. And there was one of my clients, um, older lady, probably in her late 60s, that was near my psychiatrist. And I knew that I was going to see him and I was going to be Wendy that day. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go see him and then I'm going to make arrangements to go see my client because she had computer problems. And um, I told her, I'm different now. I'm in the process of uh, transitioning from male to female. And uh, would you mind if I came as Wendy? No, I would love that. So I went, I had a blast. Mm. I fixed her computer. I did everything that she needed and then some. And then uh, she made uh, hors d'oeuvres up for me and all of that. And we sat on her patio and had drinks and talked. And she asked me all kinds of questions. And that's the other thing I've found is being open to people's questions and not getting upset with them if they say the wrong thing or phrase something in a way that is not really right. It's generally because they don't know. And what I found was I would correct them. I would say, well, this is how I would phrase that in the future. And, um, then I'd answer their question. So it got to where they would feel very comfortable with me asking me questions and asking me about my life and how I feel and all of this stuff. So after that experience, I took that email and sent it out to all 120 people. I lost three customers. That was it. And in fact, um, um, there were several customers that said, I like you better now than I did before. <laughs> Pretty easy, right? <laughs> when, no. yeah, like you said, what? you had that instant change of, uh, in those, in the salon and a couple other places when you finally came out and showed up right. as Wendy, just that, that light switch change. And right. I, it's something that, that people notice. Definitely. And I'm, putting out a different level of energy, putting out different uh, things into the, into the universe. And it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It really does. So a lot of your story and a lot of your struggle was, was pre-transition. A lot of it was societal. Once you came out, did you have anything that you struggled with still? And how did you overcome some of those things? I really didn't feel that I, I, I don't mean to uh, to sound Pollyanna about the whole thing or whatever, but I really didn't feel any struggle. I had such a high level of self-acceptance. I loved who I was for the first time in my life. And it was just an amazing experience. So, um, 
doing my name change in Pennsylvania, I had to um, I had to hire a lawyer. Um, uh, she did the paperwork for me. Uh, submitted it to the uh, uh, Bucks County Courthouse, and then we had to wait. I waited from uh, May of 2015 till December of 2015 to get a court date for my legal name change. Well, if anything, that was the acid test as to how well I uh, had transitioned and how well I accepted myself and who I was. I walked into that courtroom and it was a packed courtroom. Um, walked into there wearing a black skirt, a blouse, a jacket, looking like any businesswoman, matched my lawyer perfectly. She was a wonderful person. And um, she, she had told me before, uh, we got one of the better uh, Republican judges. Um, he's, because we could have gotten ones that were far worse. Okay. And um, then she gave me the script that I was supposed to say to the judge while I was standing at the podium in front of the courtroom. My attitude toward it that day was, oh, hell, just do it. I was just going in there and I was just going to be me and I was just going to do it. So I had to announce to the judge that I was transgender, what my male name was, and that I want it changed to Wendy uh, because I'm living full time as a female. That was the, what I had to say. And then my lawyer told me, don't say another word unless I nod to you you don't answer any of his questions because he's going to look for every way possible to shoot you down. And he tried. He tried for a good three, four minutes asking one question after another and my lawyer handled it. Hmm. And oh, I say, I was, I was wondering, like, how, how does that go? <laughs> if he asks you a question, you sort of stand there and she's like, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just went into mute mode. Mm -hmm. And my portion here is automatically that. she automatically responded to all the questions. Hmm. So he banged the gavel, said it's done. She said, When can we pick up the name change paperwork? He said, after court downstairs. Cool. I turned. This packed courtroom. The guys, most of the guys are sitting there with their jaws hanging open in shock. And I would say at least two thirds of the women were sitting there with smiles and smiling. Uh, at the end of court, the guys couldn't wait to get away from me, especially the ones that were sitting to my right. <laughs> they couldn't wait to leave. Um, it was almost like I was contagious. <laughs> And, don't want to uh, catch the gay. Don't want to catch the gay. <laughs> I'll touch her and she want. I'll become a woman. Oh God. So anyway, um, but this group of women came over and congratulated me. It was. It was. That was my first experience with cisgender women, in that, in that type of setting and everything. It was wonderful. It's so different, isn't it, when you've got like a therapist or, or uh, you know, someone who's a stylist and you've got sort of a re relationship. It's great when you get that level of acceptance from them. Mm -hmm. But when the people that have no tie to you, no reason, you know, no, um, no personal interest in the situation, when they go out of their way to come up to you and say something like that, oh, that's wonderful. It's wonderful. Mm. It's absolutely wonderful. For a good part of my first two years, Aside from being completely out to my neighbors and aside from being out to the entire gay community, uh, who they were wonderful supporters. Uh, and I, I really loved them all. And I was sitting on a patio outside a bar uh, one day and two guys walked over to me and 
they looked at me and they said, we consider you to be our little sister. Anybody ever Fs with you, you let us know. They'll never do it again. I smiled. I said, thank you. I stood up. I walked over to them and gave them both a hug. I mean, that just blew me away. I went from a lot of people in the gay community questioning me and wondering about me and all to accepting me and saying that to me. I couldn't have been more thrilled by that. It was amazing. That's and so great. I got my appointment with uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Bluebon when she was in uh, University of Maryland Hospital. And I got to October. My appointment was the, for consultation was at the end of October. Beginning of October, I got a phone call canceling my appointment. Oh, I was crushed. Uh, I was told she was moving to NYU. And I was given the name of the girl at NYU who was going to manage her calendar. I, um, <laughs> I haunted that poor girl. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of my friends, David. Uh, I went down, it was a type of neighborhood. I grabbed a drink. I went down to his, his condo unit. And he was in the kitchen and, you know, getting dinner ready and stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, David, they canceled my appointment. And he goes, ah, New York City. It's a lot easier to get to from here than Baltimore. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So um, January 10th, I went to NYU. I had my consult with Dr. Bluebon. Uh, and that was definitely the place I was going. I got a phone call at the end of that week saying your surgery date is August 31st. That was it. I started the countdown app on my phone. Every time I walked into the bar, how many more days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had his head on, my, on the bar there. <laughs> uh, every, invariably, somebody would grab their crotch and go, oh, how can you do that? <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Not all of us go through the surgery and not all of us need to. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people who absolutely needed to do this. And I, from from your consultation business, what have you seen about the the changes that have um, been made in the system? You know, um, how much easier is it? How much uh, you know better the procedures? Those sort of things from from this sort of outside perspective that you have. Right. Um, there are a lot more doctors doing the surgeries now. Um, usually, every university hospital has someone that does the surgeries. Um, it's a, um, it's definitely a, a profit center for them. And there's a lot of doctors that are going into it. Um, the younger surgeons, uh, the surgeons that have uh, uh, trained more recently uh, have newer techniques. And there's some advantages in that as well. Um, at NYU, they use a combination of surgery on the outside and robotic surgery internally to actually uh, stretch the new vagina into place and uh, fasten it in place using robotic surgery going in through your abdomen. Mm. And I literally had no real pain from that. I wasn't in a lot of discomfort after surgery. Um, my friend picked me up uh, after five days in the hospital and I navigated across Manhattan while he drove <laughs> and drove me home. And seven days after surgery, I was back hanging out with my friends at the bar. Wow, that's a quick turnaround. 
I didn't have any problems at all with it. A week. Wow, that is absolutely best case scenario. <laughs> uh huh. And the discharge nurse came in to me and she said, uh, I'm checking your records. There's no records of you taking any uh, narcotic painkillers. I said, I didn't need them. I, I was given Tylenol and Motrin. That was it. So their techniques uh, are amazing. Hmm. But, uh, and I think, uh, doctors like that are well worth the wait. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, better to wait on the, the front end than um, wait in the hospital bed or, or you know, <laughs> just stuck or in bed for weeks at a time. With pain. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have a an ethereal question. Sure. What is gender? What does the gender journey mean to you? What did transition mean to you on a on a deep level? Oh, good. It was a total alignment of my inner being, which I always knew was there. As far as I'm concerned, it should be a lot less about transitioning and more about correcting the condition you were born with to be who you've always been. Mm -hmm. And that is a much uh, easier way to look at it and begin to accept yourself. Uh, rather than look at myself as being someone who is, well, as that doctor said to me, a freak. No. I'm just a person who happened to identify as just another girl. Mm -hmm. And always did, but I couldn't accept it. I mean, and I couldn't outwardly express it. So this whole gender transition it's been wonderful in terms of my mental health, uh, my physical health. At 38 or 39, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I had triglycerides through the roof, cholesterol problems. And uh, by the time I hit my 60s, I was 70 pounds heavier than I am now. Hmm. Once... I started this whole transition process and I started working on my whole mindset and my mental processes as well. All that went away. I'm no longer type two diabetic. My triglycerides are in the bottom mm -hmm. and no cholesterol problems whatsoever. And I lost 70 pounds and I now can walk, um, I've just resumed and after moving and everything else, I just resume my walking routines and everything. And I do about four or five miles a day. Hmm. And it's been nothing but positive for me. That's so great. I heard an interesting thing uh, very recently at um, my, actually my, my trans peer group meeting that I host that the term now um, people are, are moving away from talking about gender di dysphoria, especially in terms of the diagnosis and moving towards gender incongruence. And apparently, mm -hmm. and this is something that I, w I wasn't aware of, that is that falls more in line with a typical uh, doctor's diagnosis. Like it's it's more in line with their existing lexicon and mm -hmm. is much more accepted, much more understood by them. And right. it seems to kind of be in line with what you were talking about there. That mm -hmm. it's if you talk about dysphoria, then the focus becomes transition and specifically right. medical transition. And when you talk about re realignment and gender incongruence, mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. it takes a lot of the focus off that and I think would right. allow a lot more people to to do that work and focus on themselves without the worry, without the pressure or right. the need to do some of these things, at least not until you've aligned yourself. That's right. I totally agree with that. And there's a lot of work that you can do even before you start transitioning to align yourself, what your inner being is feeling and how you want to express that and how you want to go forward with that. And it all has to do with uh, shifting your thoughts. Um, when it comes right down to it, we have thousands of thoughts going through our brains every day. 
and most of them are not helpful. And we think the same things day after day. So all those thoughts that make you fearful of your transition, that make you fear uh, that this is not going to work, all of those types of thoughts, you need to interrupt those mm. and shift away to thoughts that are more supportive and give you the uh, internal support that you need to go forward. And that's one of the things that I really focus on when I start working with someone is what's inside them and what they need to change to go forward and do it actually with joy and fun. This I've met people who um, are afraid to go to anything other than a gay bar. I go anywhere I want to go. And I've never had a problem just blending in. And it's not because I pass. I really dislike that term, too. I refer to it as blending in. That's a lot easier term for people to relate to, to understand, and it makes you feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Whereas passing, oh, I've got to fool people. No. Yeah, and, and there's a, uh, it seems like there's a lot more requirement to it, whereas blending yes. it, and it is, can be accomplished a lot more with just a mindset change. Right, exactly. And I'm totally into that. Mm -hmm. The whole mindset change is so important to this. What is your what is the biggest thing that you feel like you've been able to accomplish because of your transition? Uh, I actually made a lot of very major uh, life changes um, in terms of how I how I live, how I uh, see myself and how happy I am. That's that's been huge for me. And in terms of external to me, outside of me, I absolutely love people. I didn't before. I avoided people like the plague. That's one of the reasons I love tech. When you're in a corporate environment, nobody wants to talk to the geek. <laughs> Just come fix my computer, do, we'll do my programming and go away. That and the same thing in a wood shop, right? Especially like your loud power tools. You can't even converse with anybody. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what, it, what would you say is your favorite thing that you've learned through your transition, either about yourself or the world around you? Uh, I've learned that I can actually trust people. And uh, I've learned to do that. Um, it's something that I didn't do before. And I found it much easier to make friends. And yeah, I have, I have my gay friends. I also have women friends. Most of my friends are, uh, women. Um, in our society, and this is one of the things that I tell uh, people that I work with. The minute you start to announce that you're transitioning, expect your guy friends to vanish. They will, some will go away quickly, some will just sort of fade away. And especially the married guys, because you're now becoming a woman. And in our society, Married men don't hang out with single women that normally <laughs> or that commonly. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a thing. That's, so an, that's got, an interesting perspective. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, you've got the whole social norms of how things work. Mm -hmm. So but I've been in situations where I've met people who are otherwise very conservative in a very conservative environment. And I'll be sitting there with a group of uh, husbands and wives. And they'll be asking me questions and talking with me. And the way in which I do it and the way in which I handle it 
um, it breaks down the barriers. And I was never able to do that before. So I'm sure this is the, the the biggest and probably one of the hardest questions for you because as a transition consultant, I'm sure you have tons and tons of advice. But what are some of the key pieces of advice that you have to pass on to younger closeted trans folks out there? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the best thing that you can do for yourself is to actually begin working on your entire mindset mindset and shifting your beliefs in what is possible for you. Because as long as you hold, uh, hold on to fear, as long as you hold on to doubt, uh, that's going to make your transition and make coming out so much more difficult and more difficult than what it needs to be. Um, there's a, a common theme that I hear from people of transition is very difficult and takes a long time. If that's what you believe, then it will. But if you shift those beliefs to, yeah, I can do this and I can do this, you know, at my own pace and quicker than I thought I could do it, uh, you're going to have a good shot at having a very good and a very smooth transition. It's just you need to focus on that whole mindset. Too much emphasis, get, in my opinion, gets placed on the presentation. Once you take care of the mindset, all the rest falls into place and becomes so much easier and actually can become fun. That was my experience. And yeah, that's one of the great things to remember. Like The more fun you can make your transition, the better. I, exactly. <laughs> I heard from a friend that uh, 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 trans, a transitioning uh, trans feminine friend, right. who um, a friend of hers told her, yeah, enjoy your transition because once you're done, you're just going to be a woman. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're just going to be a woman, but that's what you always wanted to be. And that's who you always were and you're all aligned now and everything is going to work right. Well, Wendy Cole, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of your great insights. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Emily. I really appreciated it. And um, I love being here and people can connect with me. I guess you'll put, put it in the notes to the show and everything. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Your um, we have your website URL yep. right below your name, but right. you said that all you that a person needs to do is add slash connect to the end of that connect. URL to get to a page that has all of your contact information. Exactly, and the I'm open to having conversations, to talking with people, so you can schedule with me on my calendar, and um, I don't. I don't uh, put any restrictions on any of this. I, I enjoy meeting people and talking with them. So anybody out there that wants to connect with me, it's wendycolegtm.net slash connect. And I would be more than happy to uh, talk with you. There's also a uh, place there where you, where you can subscribe to my newsletter if you're not ready to talk with me, but I can support you from afar. I'll I'll do that via my newsletter and uh, check out my website. Um, I have a links page in there that, uh, you know, has all my social media and everything.